Hello and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel and today we're going to take a look at writing but specifically writing from the early medieval period up to um, shall we say the Tudor period really so quite a big bracket of history really um, but we're also going to concentrate on what's often referred to as illuminated manuscript and these are often uh, parts of books or letters, charters, documents, that sort of thing that have specifically um, been painted or given some form of artwork attached to them really. So when you look at writing in the period that we've already specified you're really talking about monastic writing so not the average letter that you would send to someone for example that would be a video in its own right really it's monastic writing so the writing that would have been done in monasteries for example in the friaries the monasteries and so on so I've got a little picture here showing what is known as a scriptorium so hopefully you can see that there that is one monk working at a desk and there would have been quite a few of them before we get the invention of uh, printing as such, which is something that is a video in its own right, documents, manuscripts, charters and so on had to be copied. So you would get one initial document and that would be copied multiple times. So I always describe the monks in the scriptorium as the photocopiers of the day, basically. And they would work at a workstation, what we would call a workstation today, which usually consisted of a writing slope. And this was quite important because writing uh, that was carried out in monasteries was done on a slope, which was meant to aid the writing and even the painting, the illumination part of it, basically. And um, these often had holes in them that would hold things like the pens or even the quills and things like that so they were quite important desks a writing slope some slopes even had ribbons on them and they were usually attached to little lead weights and they could be placed over the document to hold the paper flat when you're working on it it's very very clever stuff really but the most important thing uh, is part of the scriptorium's uh, equipment basically it consists of paper now paper uh, later on in history was often made out of pulped linen and that's a, a, a talk in its own right uh, and then obviously wood pulp which is what we often use today but paper right at the start of the early medieval period all the way through into the Tudor especially for important documents or in this case illuminated documents look like that and that is one sheet or one part of sheet uh, which has one of two names now the first name is parchment, which is often a word that you hear quite a lot. And if you go into uh, any shop selling paper, you'll be able to pay, pay, buy parchment paper. However, this is paper that looks like parchment. So it's not pure white. And parchment is generally made out of sheepskin. So you take uh, the sheepskin, a lamb, uh, it's it's stretched, it's uh, scraped, it, it's, it's covered. Uh, in in uh, all sorts of abrasives for example pumice and so on and you prepare the surface and it's stretched and dried and you will end up with something like that but there's also something called uh, vellum and vellum is usually made out of calf skin so it's baby cow basically and the reason why they often use baby animals is the skin is much softer than, a, 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 than an adult one. And if you look at documents like Magna Carta, which we mentioned the other day, um, it's surprising how many animals would have gone into producing something. Uh, when you think of the Doomsday Book, for example, that was all written on parchment. So when you work that out and the amount of pages in it to cover the whole of Angoland or England, it would have been a vast quantity of sadly baby animals. But that is your paper. And this was usually stretched out, held down on the writing slope, ready to write on. Now, before you actually put pen to paper, the paper and the pages, if it was a book, for example, had to be very carefully marked out. So the monks would take a ruler like this copy here, and this is copied from an original one, and it would be used to make sure the paper is square uh, or whatever shape you require, but generally square or rectangular. And then they would take 
one of these, which is called a pricker. And we find these also in the archeological record, usually connected with scriptoriums or monastic communities. And this one is made out of animal bone. And at the top, you have a tiny little spike. And that's really important. It's very, very sharp. And this is used with the ruler to mark down the page, the width of, or the height of the letters that you're going to do. And if you look at illuminated lettering on its own, the first letter is used, usually the boldest and the biggest one. And then obviously you'd have to think about the other lines down as well. So it's very, very carefully gridded and marked out using a pricker and a ruler. Now, they also drew a line across the page and a bit of advice for you, if you do ever go and see things like Magna Carta, uh, the Forest Charter that's also held at Lincoln Castle, which is worth going to have a look at, or any other documents like Doomsday Book, which is sometimes on display uh, in places like the British Library or the National Archives, then you will actually notice on documents and you don't you don't really see it when you look at a program about doomsday book or anything like that but if you see it in real life you will see lines going all over the paper it's as if someone's marked it out and not rubbed the lines out which you can't do actually so you would always leave the lines that i'm going to explain next now this piece of lead here sometimes graphite as well was used for marking out those lines so as well as putting pricker marks on both edges of the paper you then do a bit of dot to dot and you start drawing in the lines between the prick marks and they are always still on a lot of documents. Some of them fade over time, but I can tell you now, if you have a look at some documents, you will see them there. Now you have gridded it out and prepared the paper, you can now put pen to paper. So first of all, you need a pen. And remember that comes from a Latin word, penna, uh, which means feather basically. And if you look through the play playlist, you will see a video just on pens. And I've got a vast quantity. This is my little pen holder. And inside this one, I have a little pen, as you can see just like the ones that we've mentioned before. The finest ones are made out of goose feathers or swan feathers, and that's going to be used for your writing. And maybe in the future, uh, we could do a children's craft, for example. We keep getting asked for those, and we will do them, don't worry, uh, on how to make a goose feather pen. And if you are walking, for example, along the river to get your daily exercise, uh, if you pick up something like a feather, uh, we can show you how to make that in a future video. They are quite good to make and very easy to do, really. So that's your pen, that's going to be used for your uh, writing. And the other thing that you always see in a monk's hand, if you ever see a drawing of a scriptorium, you usually have the pen in the right hand, because obviously right-handedness was the only way. And you usually find in the left hand is a knife. Now this is often referred to as the pen knife, because it's made for sharpening the pen. It's also used for making the pen. And uh, it's also used, interestingly, if you make a mistake on a piece of parchment or vellum, uh, you actually use it to scrape out the mistake. So it's a pen knife, but it's also used for other things. It's quite, uh, quite a common thing to see in the hands of the writer. So knife in the left hand, pen in the right. You'd also need something to sharpen that knife on a regular basis. So we've got here a small piece of stone. And to actually put pen to paper, you need ink. And this is one of my small ink pots. I do have a vast quantity of ink pots, just like I have a vast quantity of pens. And this one's made out of leather and has been pitched on the inside. Now, even the ink would have been made by the individuals and the usual ingredients for it, as I mentioned in a previous video, is oak galls burnt and crushed down. You also use gum arabic and water mixed to th the, the three items together you create an ink but they used uh, um, all manner of things to create ink to be fair now i like calligraphy i'm not the best person at doing it but there are many books out there showing you how it's done and remember most documents years ago were wrote in latin or if it's earlier than that you've got a lot of early Anglo-Saxon script as well. And this book is very, very good because it tells you exactly how to formulate different words, letters, that sort of thing. It's very, very intricately done. I'm not the best person for doing uh, the fine calligraphy, to be fair. 
But once you've got a document or a letter, chart or so on done, they often use what is a little pot with sand in it. And that was usually sprinkled over the ink to stop the ink from running. In other words, it sealed the ink, it dried out the ink. Um, the other interesting thing, they sometimes use uh, a, a type of paper, what we would now call blotting paper, but that is something that comes along really in the Tudor period and continues even in schools in the 1950s, for example. Now, if we take a quick look, a brief look at illuminated lettering specifically, this is something, like I said, that the Anglo-Saxons were very good at. And obviously by the 13th century, they were very, very intricately made. And illuminated lettering usually means the first letter is uh, given some drawing, often associated with the script. And then you also have some fantastic decoration running around the outside. Now, this is official uh, illumination, official drawing, basically. And for that, they would use brushes, quite common, or even uh, reed or um, goose feather pens again. And these are uh, a couple of brushes that are actually using two different types of hair. Um, for example, you can use badger hair, uh, very, very coarse, or, or boar bristle. And for fine, intricate work, they often use things like red squirrel tail um, hair. Uh, which is absolutely fine. But obviously there is a problem these days with red squirrel. There isn't many of them around. We've got the gray squirrel that's taken over. And to manufacture the paints, they would often take some stone or even a pestle in mortar and they would grind up their own pigments and they used all sorts of things, sometimes planting vegetables, sometimes things like red ochre, yellow ochre, uh, and some even imported vast quantities of very, very rare minerals for that purpose as well and to make them once you've ground up the powder the pigment they were often mixed with things like oil or more importantly the white of an egg that was the usual thing to add to it and they made the paint just enough for what they needed to use it for to prevent drying out and the little seashells that you see here is what i've used before when I've done an event and I've actually played someone in a scriptorium. So these little seashells are very useful as your paint pigment. So you can dip your brush in and do the artwork. Once again, the, uh, the artwork was sometimes marked out and gridded out as well, using the same rulers, the lead um, or, or, or graphite uh, scribe uh, and pin pricks and so on. But for some of the ultimate documents, they also use gesso work or gold leaf. And what I've got here uh, is a little bit of uh, gold leaf. This isn't real gold leaf, by the way, because we do a lot in schools. Uh, it would just blow away and cost me a lot of money. So we've got some fake gold leaf that I usually have on a table just to demonstrate and talk about the fact that they also gave this a metallic look. But it's really interesting that documents were done like this. And like I said, um, only important documents in books were given this sort of respect. When it came to letter writing, uh, it was pretty much case of getting paper, which was usually vellum or parchment, and then taking your ink, taking your pen, and writing it more freely, more in what we would now call a freehand, really. Whereas when you look at some of these documents, they are absolutely brilliantly drawn. I will also add here, if you do ever get a chance to go to Worcester Cathedral or any big cathedral, do track down their library because medieval chained libraries, mainly because of the expense of the books they were often chained, are really worth looking at. And we've got a fantastic collection in Worcester. Um, also worth looking out for is monks often get bored in scriptoriums and what they generally do is a bit like a stonemason given a bit of free will to carve what they wanted a lot of them actually drew some funny uh, pictures around the edge what we would call graffiti really these days uh, and it could be anything it could be um, a rabbit riding on the back of um Oh, I think on the back of a horse, it could be jousting snails. I've actually seen jousting snails. I can't remember if that's a Worcester one. Uh, and also one of the worst ones, one of the strangest ones I've ever seen 
is actually a man with his underpants down and there are flames coming out of his bottom. It does actually make you wonder what he was eating uh, to create fire from the bottom. But it's monks having a bit of a laugh. Some people have said this is graffiti that people did after. Some people actually think, no, it was actually done at the time. And it could be a bit of both, really. Anyway, on that note, hopefully you've enjoyed that little introduction to uh, important documentation. And maybe next week we could do a video just on general letters. As I mentioned, not as elaborate as the ones that we've covered. Anyway, on that note, hope you're enjoying your weekend. Stay in, stay safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.